Greetings everyone. Welcome to another episode which will be our last one this season or rather this year. And uh, do let me know if everything is working on Facebook and on YouTube. We are going to be discussing the uh, varicose lesions, uh, exophytic lesions, I'm sorry. And uh, in a little bit, but first five minutes as usual, we have a little chance to say hi to each other and sort of chit chat a little bit. So uh, that's that's it and that's what we're going to do. So let's see uh, the friends who are already here. We have Dr. Nasser. Uh, hello and welcome. He is from the US. Okay, we uh, sorry, we are we are having a feedback from somewhere. Dr. Matavi, or that other phone is uh, turned off. Is the mic on that uh, also turned off? Yes. Okay. Yes. And uh, okay, because that is another thing. So, and then we have. Dr. Varun, hello, hello, and Dr. Arpan Shah who's joined us. I think so far everybody is on YouTube. Any news from Facebook? Let me see. funny Facebook is not even giving me a reminder <laughs> I am wondering if everybody else is getting their reminders now oh, okay never mind we shall wait and see if someone joins in from there we also have Dr. Shahad hello good morning and I hope I got right uh, Dr. Monica good morning nice of everybody to join us <clears throat> Dr. Puyan, hello, good morning. Yes, we also can't wait for the program actually. <laughs> right, it's so nice to have everyone here. This is a true wonder of science, I must say. And so Anyone joined in from Facebook as yet? That would be nice to know if it's working there or not. Oh yeah, okay, it's working. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and that's the... Yes. The interesting part is I got it as a reminder from someone else. The wonder of technology, okay. We also have Dr. Dipti with us. Hi. Oh yes, you are on Facebook. Thank you. Please keep us informed as to what's happening there. And we have a minute to go. Dr. Pushpalata, nice of you to join. Like I always try and say, you all can chat with each other too through the chat because I know this is one of the ways, the very few ways that everyone is getting to meet now. You don't really necessarily have to only chat with me. Good morning, Dr. Shankar. Yes, we are. 
at the beginning of our program now. Right, so <clears throat> coming to today, by, you know, by their very nature and appearance, exophytic lesions are worrisome until diagnosed because you see something exophytic, something obviously and clinically growing and you inevitably think of the worst and that mind naturally goes to something malignant because of course growth inevitably in most of our minds brings about malignancy. But the catch is always in being able to identify which is benign and which is malignant, which needs treatment, which does not need treatment. This is a distinction that is not always easy. And if you have found these uh, visions difficult so far, or you know, like to, most pathologists are forever, even if you know the lesions are forever looking for ways of uh, you know, learning more and seeing more cases, then today is the right day for you to be with us and welcome. Sorry. Right. So let me welcome you to the last live stream of 2021. And it's been a great journey and it's going to be another great hour for this a global community that we have of oral pathology enthusiasts. I'm Dr. Mandana Donahue, your host for the live stream. And if it's your first time, we hope you will find the live stream inf informative and enjoyable. And just a note on what to expect if it is your first time. Well, we have the presentation followed by a Q&A and an expert summary. So type your questions and your comments as you think of them and don't leave it for the end so that we will tackle it at the end. But, you know, if you keep, sometimes if you wait for it, you tend to forget your questions. So and coming to, of course, our speakers, a short little introduction, although both our speaker and our uh, Experts are very well uh, known currently globally, especially in the last year with many presentations and many events, but just a short intro. So Dr. Nazanin Mahdavi is currently head of the Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology, School of Dentistry, Tehran University of Medical Sciences. She's also the liaison officer for Turkey and Cyprus. And she has been a part of numerous international events. Many of us have seen her in those events and has numerous publications and presentations. She has also been a part of our events, our own events before. Welcome, Dr. Mahdavi. It is an absolute pleasure to have you here with us. And uh, coming to our expert. Well, we all know Dr. Rosna Zain is she is currently the Dean of Faculty of Dentistry, Massa University, Malaysia. She's also an honorary professor, University of Malaya, and adjunct professor, University of Erlanga, Indonesia. She is a founding director of oral cancer research and coordinating center at the University of Malaya and continues to serve the ORCC as an advisor. She's an immediate past president of the Malaysian Association for Orofacial Diseases and immediate past president of the Asian Society of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology, ASOM. She has done some groundbreaking work in PVL and uh, other precancer and cancer, cancerous lesions. And uh, it's a great, uh, great pleasure and honor to have you here with us today. Welcome, ma'am. It's uh, that it, I've been waiting for a long time to get you here. So seriously, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yes. Uh, with that, I am going to just uh, share Dr. Mahdavi's presentation and I will request her to start. Thank you very much, Dr. Mandana, for your kind invitation. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Zain. Uh, I should say that uh, it is a very, it is an honor for me to be here today. So thanks for your introduction and your invitation. Uh, as mentioned, the topic I'm going to talk about today is um, benign appearing exophytic lesions of the oral cavity. And I'm going to discuss on the histopathologic view and the diagnosis of these challenging cases. As you know, the term oral exophytic lesions is described as pathologic gross projections uh, projected over the normal contour of oral mucosa. 
they have different uh, reasons like hypertrophy, hyperplasia, or neoplasia. But clinically, they may appear the same. And also, we all know that uh, many, um, many of these lesions are uh, reactive hyperplastic lesions. But, but on the other hand, some of malignancies or benign tumors can appear there clinically. So in the, today's presentation, I'm going to talk about these cases. So let's start with the first case. Okay. Uh, this case, uh, she was a 32-year-old female. Um, when she uh, uh, came to our center, she had that exophytic mass in the right mandibular gingiva between first and second molar teeth. But she had a story behind this. She said that she had had this lesion before, almost three, four months ago. She visited her general dentist, and the general dentist uh, discovered this lesion during routine clinical examinations, routine dental examinations. And uh, the dentist excised the lesion, but did not send the lesion to the pathology lab. Um, now, after some while, um, one or two months, the lesion recurs. And when we visited the patient, it was three months after the first excision of the lesion. So, as you can see, the lesion is a pink nodule, smooth surface, and was painless and non hemorrhagic. Um, regarding the ex uh, clinical examination, I should say that the second molar tooth had grade two um, mobility, and except this, other things were normal. This is another view of the lesion, which you can see that pink exophytic nodule on the gingiv mandibular gingiva. This is the radiographic picture of the, for the patient uh, um, panoramic view. Um, you can see a little rarefaction between the first and second molar tooth, but except that there is nothing um, that comes to the mind. So the lesion was excised, uh, excisionally excised. And the differential diagnosis that performed and suggested by clinician were um, irritation fibroma, uh, pyogenic granuloma, fibrotic, of course, pyogenic granuloma, which means a pyogenic granuloma is being healed, and um, benign uh, mesenchymal tumors. This is the picture what we saw under the microscope. Here you can you can see the oral mucosa, and this is the lesion. As you can see, there is a distance between the lesion and your line of oral mucosa, but it was not, I should say that it was uh, well demarcated, but it was not encapsulated. This is a closer uh, view of the lesion. Here you can see interlacing bundles and fascicles of spindle-shaped mesenchymal appearing cells. Uh, and also, uh, lots of slit-like vessels are in the background stroma. Uh, a little bit of inflammation and extravasated RBCs as well are also seen. This is another uh, view of the lesion, which you can see streaming, streaming interweaving uh, fascicles. Uh, and uh, here you can see uh, the nuclei of the lesion in more details. And you can see that the nucleus have, uh, I don't, I cannot say that they, they have atypia, but there were mild nuclear pleomorphism in some areas. Some uh, seems to be larger or a little bit hyperchromatic. And also, uh, something that you can see here is that uh, um, kind of nuclear palisading was uh, seen in some parts, resembling what is shown in schwannoma, but did not fulfill its criteria. This is another view of the lesion. Again, you can see uh, long interlacing fascicles of uh, spindle-shaped cells 
and you can see that it's highly cellular. Here you can see more details about the nucleus, nucleus feature of the lesion. As you can see, uh, uh, they have fusiform nuclei, but some of them had a kind of blunt ended, but some not. So uh, when it comes to our mind, uh, it's a mesenchymal tumor, but we should uh, investigate more to know its origin, whether it has a neural origin, fibroblastic, myofibroblastic, or smooth muscle origin. And also, when you look at the, um, the closely look at the uh, tumor, you can see that they were occasionally mitotic figures that could be seen um, among the tumor. Not very rare, but not very common. You could find them occasionally among the tumor cells, as you can see here in this picture. So uh, we decided to uh, make ISC studies for this case. And uh, the first thing that we performed was care 67 staining, which indicates the number of the uh, mitotic cells, not only mitotic cells, the cells are going to divide. You know, care 67 is expressed in all cell phases except G0. So, um, usually we use it as a adjunctive tool to help us to distinguish between malignant and benign mesenchymal tumors. I know that there are some scientific criticism, criticisms regarding the use of CARE67 as the cutoff for malignant, and so, you know, as a tool that can distinguish between malignancy and benign tumors, but, but sometimes it works. So in this case, you can see that there are a high K67 staining. Smooth muscle actin um, staining reveals that almost all the cells were positive for this uh, marker. Um, and in the right picture, you can see the vessels that are um, positive for SMA, which serves as an internal control for this marker. Also, the tumor cells, the fusiform tumor cells, are all positive uh, for SMA. S100 was negative in the tumor. And because there were lots of uh, slit-like vessels in this tumor, we wanted to make sure if it is a vascular tumor or not. So CD34 was performed, uh, IC was performed, and you can see only the vessels have stained and there's no positivity among tumor cells in this picture. So based on um, what was said, uh, the uh, spindle cell sarcoma with histological and immunohistochemical uh, features of uh, leiomyosarcoma was uh, suggested. And of course, the, the tumor was graded uh, according to the presence of necrosis, to the presence of, or absence of atypia, and the number of the mitotic cells. And it was graded as grade one. Um, there was no necrosis in the tumor. There were minimal atypia, and the number of the mitot mitosis were not very much uh, high. And also no lymphovascular invasion was seen in this. So uh, we came to the diagnosis of low-grade leiomyosarcoma. So this is a number of the cases of intraoral leiomyosarcoma that have been reported in the English literatures. So I should say that it's not a very common lesion in the uh, oral cavity. Better to say it's rare. Uh, but as you see in our case, and, I, and as I um, studied in other cases, clinically, it can mimic the benign appearing, especially reactive oral lesions. 
Here you can see that's less than 20 cases of Lyme sarcoma in the oral cavity has been reported. So based on uh, this um, diagnosis, the lesion was resected, bone resection was performed under general anesthesia. The lesion was excised. And as far as I know, after almost two years, the, the patient is doing well and uh, there is no recurrence or metastasis uh, of the lesion. So this was case uh, number one. Um, so maybe we can go to the further and start with the second case. This is case number two. She was a young lady. She had this mass on her uh, maxillary gingiva. She said I had it for um, one or two months, but recently it has a faster growth. Um, and um, she said, I think it, its onset was during pregnancy, but she wasn't very much sure about it. As you can see, it is a um, mass uh, that is uh, ulcerated and uh, has a lobulated surface. So this is the, uh, the lesion was excised with the diagnosis of pyogenic granuloma, clinical differential diagnosis of uh, pyogenic granuloma, or uh, peripheral giant cell granuloma. This is uh, on what we saw under the uh, microscope. Here you can see the covering or epithelium of the lesion, and as you can see, the lesion has a lobulated surface, and in some parts, the lesion was ulcerated, there was no epithelium, and beneath there, you could see lots of vascular channels in, uh, in different sizes. Many of them were congested, and the uh, background was an inflammatory background with mixed inflama inflammatory cells infiltration and uh, plump uh, fibroblastic cells. Here is another view of the lesion, which you can see there's a granulation tissue-like composed of uh, different sized blood vessels within an inflamed connective tissue. Uh, which has an edematous background in some parts and also has an inflammatory background in many areas. Here in this part, you can see the same feature. And this feature was repeated in a, a, every section. In some parts, more collagenization was uh, seen, but uh, the presence of many vascular channels and inflammation was uh, something that could be seen in uh, many fields. So as I'm sure all of you has came to the decision, this is pyogenic granuloma, which is an inflammatory reactive lesion of the oral cavity. It is very much common, um, can, have, uh, can reach to a huge size, like what we see in this present case. Um, but um, the, the problem is that, that we have some lesions that clinically can mimic its appearance. So despite its large uh, um, size, it was pyogenic granuloma. So here it is a schematic view of pyogenic granuloma and how it develops. So maybe we can go further to the next case. This is case uh, number three. 
uh, first of all, I should say that the picture does not belong to this case. I took it from internet because it had some uh, clinical features of what uh, our case have. So it can, it can help you to imagine how it was looking. But this uh, picture does not belong to me and does not belong to this case. So uh, in this case, a 30-year-old female uh, was referred to uh, to uh, our dental clinic. She was a young uh, lady. She had a lobulated uh, mass with ulcerated surface on the retromolar area, uh, left side. The, as you can see, the, the size of the lesion was almost large. It was uh, two and a half centimeters in two and a half centimeters. And the clinical differential diagnosis that was suggested by the surgeon was pyogenic granuloma. So uh, as we were evaluating the lesion under the light microscope, you could see uh, that uh, there is a mass beneath the epithelial lining of the oral mucosa. On the top of the picture, you can see the stratified squamous epithelium of oral mucosa covering the lesion, which is ulcerated and replaced by fibrinoleucocytic membrane. In some parts beneath the fibrinoleucocytic membrane, you can see some granulation tissue, which is normal. But the, on the other hand, the, there is, uh, in the uh, other side of the lesion, there is, uh, you can see some cystic spaces that seems to be lined by epithelium. So we will have a closer look on the picture and see what we can see. So beside that uh, um, cystic spaces, there are also some solid islands that you could see them uh, here. So this is a closer look of the lesion. You can see the cystic spaces that some of them are filled with a secretory material. The cysts are lined by an uh, admixture of epidermoid and mucous cells. Many of mucous cells have large size. They have uh, columnal, they are columnal cells with gobletoid appearance, as you can see here. And there are lots of cystic spaces with minimal solid growth pattern. Here's another picture of the lesion. You can see that goblet mucous cell like cell, mucous cells that are lining the cystic spaces. And also, there are a number of uh, epidermoid cells that are intermixed with mucous cells. Many of the mucous cells have goblet appearance. And uh, also, you can see some uh, intermediate cells. Mm -hmm. So here you can you have some intermediate cells, as you can see them here, small uh, cells with basaloid uh, feature and very scant cytoplasm. Um, the, so the three kind of cell population was observed in this picture. Also, you can see inside the cystic lumens there are secretory materials. So. As I'm sure many of you has reached the diagnosis, the diagnosis of mucoepidermoid carcinoma was performed for this case. And uh, I, um, according to the brand wide grading system, it was graded as low grade. There was lots of cystic spaces, more than 20% and uh, no cellular atypia, no necrosis and no invasion to the surrounding structures was detected in uh, our um, specimen. But of course, since the les uh, lesion was believed to be a reactive lesion, it wasn't completely excised, although they claimed that it was an excisional biopsy. So uh, we came to uh, we make a note for the surgeon that it should be excised again. And, uh, and 
Uh, and I know that the legend has been emphasized uh, appropriately and has, in has, it has been three years since then. The patient is visited by his, uh, her surgeon and uh, there's no recurrence of the lesion. But one thing that I would like to mention uh, today about this case is that um, many uh, tumors, uh, especially mycoepidermoid carcinoma, is a malignant salivary gland tumor can, that can clinically mimic uh, some benign and reactive oral lesions like pyogenic granuloma, or mucosal. So um, some micro, there have been reported some mucoepidermoid carcinomas that clinically were diagnosed as pyogenic granuloma, as in our, our case, or mucosal because of excess uh, production of mucus that could be uh, produced by the tumor. So they could clinically appear as mucosal. The other thing that I would like to mention is that in some parts of the oral cavity, if you have a salivary gland tumor, the tumor is uh, more likely to be a malignant tumor, like the tumors in the tongue, uh, the tumor, the salivary gland tumor in the floor of the mouth. If you have a salivary gland tumor in the floor of the mouth, it is more likely to be a malignant tumor, especially mucoepidermoid carcinoma. And in the Retromolar area, especially more than 90% of the salivary gland tumors in this area are malignant tumor, especially mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Putting this to this fact that mucoepidermoid carcinoma can clinically appear as pyogenic granuloma or mucosal, we should make more consideration for, for lesions appearing as pyogenic granuloma in the area of retromolar. So I would love to um, hear your valuable comments after the presentation, especially about this case. So maybe we can continue with the next case. So this case is um, case number four. She was a 46-year-old female. She had an exophytic mass in the right mandibular gingiva. When we saw her, she has, he had had a tooth extraction and there was an exophytic mass extruded from the extraction socket. And when they asked for the patient for, a, for a, a history, she said that she had pain in this area, in the mandibular area, right mandibular area. And the dentist uh, make a RCT, root canal therapy, for the patient. But the pain did not relate. So after a while, they thought that maybe the, the tooth is, um, has some, some grade of mobility and they decided to extract the tooth. So the tooth was extracted after root canal therapy, but the pain still persists. Then the patient came to our center, uh, to dental clinic of School of Dentistry of Tehran University of Medical Sciences, with the chief complaint of pain and extrusion of a lesion that stands up from the socket of the extracted tooth. So uh, in this um, step, the diagnosis of the patient was that it is a part of the clinician was that it is a pyogenic granuloma. They said that um, most probably it's a pyogenic granuloma that comes uh, from the uh, socket. But, but also they asked for more um, paraclinical evaluation and CBCT was performed for this patient. Here you can see the um, cross-sectional picture of that patient. Here you can see that there is a lytic mass uh, inside the mandibular bone, as you can see. And also, although it causes uh, no expansion or minimal expansion, the lingual cortical plate is perforated. 
Also, the margin of the legend are ragged and ill-defined. Here's another view of uh, the imaging. Here uh, on the top, you can see the an, a radiolucent lesion in the area that has a kind of ill-defined borders. And uh, in the and on the other pictures, you can see that the lesion has caused uh, a radiolucency inside the mandible and perforation of lingual cortical bone could be seen in this picture. Also, when you come to the, uh, the, to the last picture, you can see uh, that some parts of the buccal cortical bone is also perforated by the lesion. Uh, um, but uh, the borders of the inframandibular nerve were intact. And also, there was no root resorption. So there was a radiolucent lesion inside the mandibular bone that uh, causes no root resorption and was not invading to the mandibular canal, but it was radiolucency with ill-defined and bracked border that perforated both buccal and lingual uh, cortical plates. They excised the lesion, uh, but not all the lesion, ju just the part that was stand out of the socket and send out to pathology lab with the diagnosis of granulation tissue. Here you can see that in the, so pick, here you can see the superficial oral epithelium, which is first, uh, um, in some parts are ulcerated, but uh, why that has an epithelium in this, uh, in this lesion that is extruded from the socket. And also beneath this, you have a lot of uh, inflammatory cells infiltration. This is a closer view uh, of the lesion. You can see um, a background of highly inflamed connective tissue. And within this inflammatory background, you can see some islands of epithelial cells. When we go deeper to the lesion, in the deeper part, there were uh, obvious uh, uh, and clear islands of epithelial cell with squamous appearance. The, um, what we can see in this picture that the cells uh, show prominent nuclear atypia. They couldn't produce keratin. There was no keratin um, formation. And also the nests were invading um, in the form of the tumor was invading in by forming small nests and uh, small islands. Also, um, you know, single files and single cells could be seen among the tumor cells. So as you can see, this is a squamous cell carcinoma. There was a primary intraosseous squamous cell carcinoma, which extruded, was extruded from the extraction socket of the patient. The reason patient had pain and they performed uh, uh, root canal therapy and she didn't respond to the uh, root canal therapy and they excised the, uh, extracted the tooth, but the pain persisted again. It was that the reason was something else. There was a primary intraosseous squim cell carcinoma inside the patient's mandibular bone that uh, was causing a um, defect in the patient's bone. Here you can see some case series of uh, primary intramandibular squamous cell carcinoma. As you can see, it is not a common feature. When we call a lesion primary intraosseous squamous cell carcinoma, we mean that it does not originate from the um, covering oral mucosa of the oral cavity. It's not from the oral epithelium of the oral cavity. The origin of this um, tumor is an um, epithelial cell inside the uh, mandibular or maxillary bone. But the source of epithelial cells inside jaw bones, we all know that are odontogenic. 
primary intraosseous squamous cell carcinoma can arise de novo or from pre-existing uh, odontogenic cyst or sometimes tumor. But in our case, uh, there was no cyst that um, in, was involved in this lesion. It was a, uh, it was, uh, a de novo lesion. So thanks for your attention for this case. And I would also like to ask you to enjoy these beautiful pictures, which I'm going to put between the cases. Uh, these are some beautiful uh, parts of my country. This is a historical house in Shiraz, a city in the south part of Iran. Okay, we come to the next case. This is case number five. Actually, I think we're going so fast. Mandana, dear Mandana, I think I can um, uh, also talk about the last case. Uh, okay, this is case number yeah, five. Yeah, you can, you can. This yes. is also an interesting case. Uh, thank you. Yes, we are going so fast. <laughs> uh, this is uh, the, the case. Uh, um, the patient is a 70-year-old male. Uh, he had an exophytic, exophytic mass in her uh, in his mandibular gingiva. You can see in the lingual part of the gingiva. Uh, he said that he had this lesion for two months. Uh, the, the lesion was painless, non-hemorrhagic, and as you can see, there was a, a necrosis, an ulcerated uh, ulceration in the middle of the uh, lesion, middle part of the lesion. Otherwise, there was nothing that comes to mind. The differential diagnosis performed and suggested. And Dr. Mahdavi, we lost your voice. Actually, we lost your video too. By the um, clinician was a peripheral. Uh, Dr. Mahdavi, I think you can turn off your camera. Sorry, everyone, we have a slight internet speed issues that side. Uh, she should be back any minute. Uh, Dr. Mahdavi, can you turn off your camera and try? Oops, okay. Okay, so let's just uh, uh, Dr. Zain, ma'am, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yes, okay, excellent. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I think until she's got some uh, issues there, so until then I think we can just uh, discuss a few things and uh, you know, we had a very interesting question uh, from Professor Joss on one of the earlier cases. So maybe we can discuss that one. Right. Here it is. Uh, do you think that pyogenic granuloma and lobular capillary hemangioma are two separate entities or part of a spectrum? Um, yes. Hi, uh, Professor Joss Hill. Haven't seen you for a long, long time. Um, yeah, um, I uh, personally feel that uh, pyogenic granuloma or lobular capillary hemangioma is probably the same thing. 
um, I, I probably do not separate them when when I uh, diagnose them. Although when there is uh, quite a lot of um, capillaries, uh, I, I think it may be, as you say, a spectrum of um, the uh, capillary hemangioma with um, uh, with more of granulation tissue and you get into the pyogenic granuloma. I think that that's what I'm thinking of, yeah. Okay, and we have one, I think, from Dr. Said. Yes, thank you for sharing the nice case. What gradient system you follow up in mucoepithelial carcinoma as well? I think you can answer this and then we can ask Dr. Nazin in what she follows. <laughs> well, um, I have to say that I have um, I have been uh, have not been um, doing the diagnostic and I do not see that much of this. Uh, so I'm um, I do not really I mean I, I guess I follow a very traditional grading system and I used to do it low grade and high grade. Uh, but I know that uh, we also will look into whether there is um, uh, cystic. Uh, variety and things like that. But I think for this, it would be good to, if we can get Dr. Nazanin to actually talk yeah. about this more. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Um, she has still not joined. Anything else you want to share with us, uh, ma'am, about the cases that have so far finished? Um, you're asking me? <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, I think in summary, I think what, what she is trying to show is uh, trying to say that clinically, they all look like pyogenic granuloma or peripheral giant cell granuloma. And she was able to show that um, for one of it, it turned out to be uh, lyomyosarcoma, uh, while for another one that turned out to be mucoepidermoid. Uh, but what's uh, interesting uh, is, I think, especially case three, I thought she had uh, also um, uh, some radiolucency, if I'm uh, if I'm not mistaken, and these are uh, things that actually uh, gives clues because biogenic granuloma would not, would not actually do that. Okay, she's back. Okay, yes, she's hi. back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dr. Nazanin, you have our voice and everything okay there? I don't think she has our voice. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, so until we part, uh, did you hear me? Should I go back from the case number five? Start from the beginning yes, of case yes, number I five? Yes, yes, I think so. Case number five, yes. Perfect. Uh, okay. Okay. So... Uh, it's still not shared here. The <laughs> this is case number five. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. she, uh, it was a seventy-year-old male. He had a painless exophytic mass, as you can see in the mandibular gingiva, left mandibular gingiva, area of premolar in the lingual side of uh, the gingiva. The lesion was painless and not, it was not hemorrhagic. As you can see, there's a necrotic um, alteration in the middle part of the mass. And uh, beside this, this, there was nothing uh, specially for this lesion. The differential diagnosis suggested by the clinician were peripheral ossifying fibroma, pyogenic granuloma, and peripheral giant cell granuloma. This is the growth appearing of the lesion. As you can see here, the, uh, the, the necrotic uh, area that uh, you could see here as a depression in the growth of the lesion. This is the panoramic view of the case. Uh, as you can see, there was nothing um, inside no, no lesion inside the bone uh, everything seems to be normal but i remember that when i talked to the surgeon 
she said that while she was excising uh, the lesion, she felt that there is a kind of depression beneath in the bone beneath the lesion, but it was just only a saucerization of the bone, what was and the bone was not involved. So and you know that it could be normally seen in uh, many even reactive lesions in the oral cavity. So the excised the lesion, uh, the biopsy was an excisional biopsy, and they sent it to our department, to our lab. As you can see, uh, what, uh, here is what we see under the light microscope. This is the overlying oral epithelium. Here you can see that it's covering the lesion. In some part, the um, retro, uh, retroridges are flattened and in some parts not. But beneath the epithelium, here you can see the lesion, that it looks like to have a myxoid background. And in the other part, you can see that there are inflammatory cells infiltration uh, inside the lesion. If you remember the clinical appearance of the lesion, it was ulcerated. So it is normal for an ulcerative lesion, especially in the oral cavity, to have inflammatory cells infiltration uh, inside the lesion. And you can see them uh, under the light microscope. This is another view of the lesion. Here you can see that uh, there is a mixoid background and inside this background you can see that there are uh, fusiform spindle-shaped cells and some stellate-like cells. There, the cells look like fibroblast mesenchymal cells that are arranged uh, randomly in this background. Also, inflammatory cells infiltration, mostly chromic, could be seen in this section. This is another view. Also, you can see that spindle-shaped and stellate-shaped fibroblast uh, within a mixoid background. Uh, here you can have a closer look of the um, lesion, and you can see that it has, uh, you can see no cellular pleomorphism uh, and atypia among this uh, lesion. There was no necrosis also. Based on this histological feature, the, uh, some differential diagnosis came to our mind as oral pathologists. They were odontogenic myxoma, actually soft tissue, better uh, soft tissue myxoma, but it has been suggested by some authors that uh, soft tissue myxomas in the oral cavity especially in the gingiva, could be, uh, should be uh, called odontogenic myxoma. So uh, one of the differential diagnoses for odontogenic myxoma, the other were tumors with neural origin and for oral focal mucinosis. I know uh, that there are, and of course, you know that there are um, other tumors that can have this mixoid background, like tumors of adipose tissue, some uh, fibrous hysteresthetic tumors, but uh, they are not common lesions inside the oral cavity. We decided to uh, work with uh, these three tumors, and if we didn't reach to a decision, then we will go further and have another step to evaluate other rare lesions in the oral cavity. So we started with these three lesions. As you know that some tumors with neural origin, especially neurofibroma, can have a mixoid background. Uh, and what can help us uh, for differentiation of these tumors, especially from myelis, is uh, the presence of mat cells maybe. Uh, if uh, we could see them and the immunoreactivity for S100 that is seen uh, scattered immunoreactivity in neurofibroma. The other tumor that uh, could be um, 
considered as a differential diagnosis, not a tumor, the other legend that could be considered as a differential diagnosis is oral focal mucinosis, which is a mass uh, that is not a common mass, but the most common site of involvement uh, in the oral cavity are uh, gingiva and heart palate. It results from overproduction of hyaluronic acid by fibroblasts. So we put this in our list too. And as you know, oral focal mucinosis uh, is a legend that um, started just beneath the epithelium and makes the epithelial lining flattened. It is not capsulated, but it is um, well circumscribed. And normally no mast cells and no reticulin fibers could be found in this. And usually it has no inflammation and little capillaries inside. So this is the reticulin staining of the lesion. As you can see, it's staying strong, positive uh, for reticulin. And uh, so the presence of um, or a focal mucinosis could be somehow ruled out by the staining. Also, we performed ocean blue uh, in this case, but uh, I have no picture of this here. Uh, something that uh, I should mention regarding the histological uh, feature of this legend that was not very well demarcated uh, and somehow had ill defined borders. This is KL67 staining of the legend. As you can see here, the overlying oral epithelium, as these are the basal cell layer, cell layer that show uh, mm, nuclear positive staining for KR67, which serves as an internal control in the staining. And beneath this area, inside the lesion, you can see very little reactivity for KI67, which indicates that the tumor has a low proliferative activity. This is another the picture of K67 staining in, uh, inside the lesion. You can see few scattered positive cells here, 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 but there were few positive cells among the tumor. The tumor shows low reactivity for K67 staining generally. Also, muscle acting um, was uh, asked to be uh, stained in this lesion. And as you can see, there is no reactivity among tumor lesions. However, some uh, vessels show positive reactivity for smooth muscle acting. This also serves as, internal, as an internal control, but among the lesional cells, there were no immunoreactivity for smooth muscle active or very little scattered uh, cells that show immunoreactivity for smooth muscle active. We also performed S100 um, to differentiate neurofibroma. As you can see, this is the epithelial lining of the lesion and that uh, small cells with stellate shape are longer hand cells that normally are positive for S100. So this also serves as an internal control for the IC staining. But inside the lesion, you can see that there is no reactivity for S100 or very small, uh, very, uh, you know, um, scattered uh, reactivity in some parts. But generally, there was no reactivity. This is vimentine staining, and as you can see, almost all the cells inside the lesion shows immunoreactivity for vimentine and were positive for vimentine, um, as you can see in this picture. So what comes to our mind is that the presence of reticulin um, could somehow rule out oral focal mucinosis. S100 was negative, so the neurofibroma was ruled out, and we came to the decision that it was peripheral odontogenic myxoma. 
So as far uh, as I know, peripheral odontogenic myxoma is not a common lesion inside, uh, it's not a common lesion. Um, despite its central uh, counterpart, the peripheral odontogenic fibroma seems to have a bland uh, uh, behavior. It's not very aggressive. But there was at least one case report that a peripheral odontogenic myxoma had recurred. So in this case, since the margins were still involved, we make a note to the surgeon and ask him to excise it completely or follow up the patient, whatever he decided. So there's still one case, dear Mandana. Shall I continue to this case, or we will, or you ask me to stop here? How long do you think it will take? Five, ten five, minutes. Five, six minutes. Okay, then five please continue. to six minutes. I think. Okay, it's okay, but please continue. Sorry, I, okay, thank you. This is the last case, um, and also it's an interesting case. Uh, he was a 51-year-old man. He had a lesion inside his mouth. He, he said, I have it for two months. The lesion was uh, painless, was not bleeding. And, uh, you know, the patient's chief complaint was that it interferes with my speaking, with my chewing, but otherwise there was not, no problem. The differential diagnosis suggested by the clinician were salivary gland tumors, uh, reactive inflammatory lesions like uh, peripheral giant cell granuloma or pyrogen granuloma and benign mesenchymal tumors. So they excise, they make an incisional biopsy. They send a part of the lesion to the, our lab. And this is what we saw under the light microscope. You can see that epithelium on the surface, which is atrophic. And beneath that epithelium, you can see that some uh, sheets of clear cells, uh, epithelioid-like cells, intermixed with some eosinophilic cells within a highly vascular background. Uh, if I have another picture, uh, regarding the background, I should say it was highly vasculated, but the the vascular uh, the texture was very delicate. Here is another view of the lesion. You can see some eosinophilic cell cells with eosinophilic cytoplasms intermixed with um, cells with clear cytoplasm. So, uh, you know, there, were, there seems to be a carcinoma but needs for further evaluation. Even uh, we want to make sure that it is a primary carcinoma, not a metastatic. It was a carcinoma with unknown origin. So um, we decided to uh, start with IHC studies and have a step-by-step -step plan. So one of the things that came to our mind was melanoma, some kind of lymphoma, and also primary squamous cell carcinoma, although it doesn't seem to be connected to the surface epithelium, or metastatic renal cell carcinoma. Uh, this is CD10 staining, which is positive in this uh, tumor cells. This is EMA epithelial membrane antigen, which is positive. Uh, membranous positivity you can see in the lesion of cells. And K67 also was performed, which was high, almost 30%, and HMB45 uh, was negative. So uh, in this point, um, we had a conversation with the surgeon and surgery team because in some instances, the insurance does not fully cover some of the paraclinical evaluation. And the patient, I, as far as I remember, was not in a good economic situation. So we had a, a conversation with the surgery team and we came to the decision that in this step does not go, do not go further. And this is the diagnosis that was performed, clear cell carcinoma. 
uh, and we had a note that they should uh, evaluate for uh, the patient for metastatic carcinoma. This decision, because the surgeon wanted to um, have a PET scan from patient. So if it was a metastatic carcinoma, they could see it in that. This is the PET scan result of the patient. You can see multiple randomly distributed pulmonary nodules in both in both lungs, right and left. Also in the left kidney, there was a mass, uh, almost five centimeters in the left kidney. So um, the, the diagnosis of metastatic clear cell carcinoma was um, performed. And the interesting part of this case is that the, it was the first presentation of the tumor. The first presentation of the tumor was uh, that um, it, the metastasis to the oral cavity. The patient was in a very good health situation. He was an athlete. He used to exercise every day. And it was hard for the patient to accept the diagnosis and uh, treatment. So as long as I followed the patient, he refused to receive any treatment. So that was my last case. Thank you very much for your attention and time. Maybe we can yes. go with the comments or questions or if yes. there's any. Yes. Um, yeah, you have our voice. So what happened was uh, when you had a break, we went through uh, ma'am's uh, summary. So now we will just go through some of the questions that you missed and then we'll continue from there. <laughs> so uh, one of the first questions we had uh, was from Dr. Bilal. And this was, I think, in relation to your case number two where he asked, why not pregnancy-induced epilis? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Dr. Mathavi, you can answer that if you have uh, my I, voice. Uh, can you uh -huh. read the question for me? I didn't hear the question. Yeah, it, it is a why not pregnancy induced epilis. This was in case number two. Uh huh. That was uh, a so, granulation tissue, pyogenic granuloma. Yeah. So I think that was his question was why not pregnancy induced epilis. I think you described that in the presentation possibly. Uh, let me go to the next one. Okay, there was another one from Professor Hilly, and you were not there that time. So do you think that pyogenic granuloma and lobular capillary hemangioma are two separate entities or part of a spectrum? Dr. Mathavi, I think if you is? stop, uh, you can close your presentation so you have the screen. Because then you will see the questions. Uh, I, I think I have stopped sharing. You have stopped sharing, but also close the presentation on your own. Uh, so do you have this window now? Uh, do you have the, uh, can you see the uh, StreamYard window? Yes, yes, I have it. Okay, so now you can see actually the question on the being shared on the screen. So From Professor Hilly, there's a question. Was, uh, are, um, yes. Uh, do you think pyogenic granuloma and lobulated capillary hemangiomas are two separate entities or part of a spectrum? This is the question. Yes, yes, that is the question. So yes. according to some text, according to some text, we consider uh, um, Lobular uh, capillary hemangioma and pyogenic granuloma as one entity. And this is how we uh, make the diagnosis in our center. But if the lobulation is very uh, critical feature in the diagnosis, in performing the diagnosis, I should say that in many cases we have pyogenic granuloma that do not have this, um, you know, lobulated appearance. Okay. 
Um, our next one is from Dr. Nasser Saeed. So uh, okay. he said, thank you for sharing the case. Oh, sorry, did you me. want to say case, something else? I want else? to hear uh, Dr. Zain's uh, and also, if it's possible. Which, yes, which in this question? case, I would love to hear Dr. Zain's opinion also uh, regarding the pyogenic granuloma and lobular capillary hemangioma. Yeah, I, I think I uh, mentioned earlier that I would uh, I look at it as a single, I do not separate them into pyogenic uh, granuloma or lobular, but as part of the same uh, lesion, uh, although it could be uh, the, uh, part of a spectrum, but when I do the diagnosis, I uh, I tend to only uh, diagnose pyogenic granuloma more than uh, lobular capillary hemangioma. Yes. yes. Now the next question is from Dr. Said. What grading system you follow up in mucoepinamide? Uh, we use the brand bank grading system, uh, although I, we know that it, uh, in some cases it, um, you have overgrading by using this system. But when you, when you have a low grade in this system, then you make sure that it is a low grade tumor. And it was a low grade, grade one tumor. Okay. So, and uh, Professor uh, Joss says about the intraosseous carcinoma that it's a very interesting and rare case and it should be documented. So, I guess he's telling you to publish that. <laughs> and uh, we have already published it. <laughs> Okay, okay. So, and uh, then there was uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Madev who said uh, odontogenic myxoma, I think that was case five. So actually she was uh, fairly quite close. I think it was the peripheral od uh, odontogenic myxoma case. And then we have this doctor from Dr. Shahad. Uh, how do you prove for sure it was of intraosseous origin if the lesion protrudes into the oral cavity? This is exactly a concern, a, you know, a logical concern that every pathologist and clinician should have because it's very rare um, comparing with his central counterpart. So um, I, I asked, I talked to the surgeon. They said that the bone was intact. But also when I was talking to her, she, uh, you know, uh, somehow she is uh, sick and worried about this too. I didn't have the pictures for CBCT uh, and uh, CBCT cross sections revealed that the bone was okay. But uh, but of course I didn't put them here, uh, so the question seems to have sense. Okay, I think we have finished with the questions, so I will just share some comments that we had. Um, yes, so Dr. Hari Shankar says beautiful cases. Dr. Nasser says, thank you for the great correction. Dr. Arpansha also says, very nice cases, thank you. Dr. Puyan says, great presentations, thank you, Razanin. And it was interesting to see that uh, uh, in uh, Iran, in the Tehran University, they are watching it actually in a classroom. So that was rather interesting. <laughs> it was a good way, yes. And... Uh, Dr. Nandini also says a very nice presentation. I think with that, our comments are over. So, uh, ma'am, uh, uh, anything you want to add further? Yeah, I, I, as I was saying earlier, I think um, Dr. Nazarin, Nazanin has actually uh, presented a good collection to, uh, to stress on uh, the fact that uh, there may be mimics and especially mimics to the pyogenic granuloma. And therefore, I think uh, what she's trying to say is to, uh, you need to look into the details. And I presume most of these cases are kind of larger cases uh, that you would also be kind of suspicious, although uh, you do get quite um, big cases of pine and granuloma. Anyway, congratulations. I think you've done a good job in uh, putting it out uh, in that way.
Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your uh, additional uh, comments and for being there when we had a little bit of <laughs> gap. <laughs> <laughs> that made it all so much more easier. So we also have Dr. Varun saying great presentation. Dr. Joss saying good collection of cases for teaching GPs as Professor Zainab says. Yes, absolutely. So uh, with that, I think we have everything covered. So thank you, Dr. Nazarin. That was a, indeed a great presentation. Thank you. May and I address a, very thorough... a, a valuable study that I was... Uh... Yes, please go on. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I, should, I want to address a valuable study which I found and I used it a lot that was uh, conducted by Professor Zain regarding the... Uh, uh, you know, the prevalence of mucosa lesions in Malaysia, which helped me a lot um, in the, my presentation. So I would like to thank Professor Zain. Welcome. I'm happy that it's of help. <laughs> yes. Ma'am, your work is of great help in many ways. <laughs> yes. So... Ah, uh, yes, let me share the certificates. Uh, thank you, dear Nazanin. It's uh, a wonderful pleasure. It's, uh, I mean, you are not just a colleague, you're also a friend, and it's great to have you here. Thank you so much for being with us today and doing this. And, ma'am, thank you so much. I know you were busy. You came in here directly from another meeting. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. I. Uh, enjoyed this session and uh, thank you for dragging me in <laughs> and nice to meet um, Dr. Nazanin. I've never met you. <laughs> yes, it, this is the good part about being here is you get to meet more people and yes, everyone does say I'm rather persistent. I guess I'm quite a pest. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're the best. <laughs> thank you. Okay, Although then. I was thinking thank more you. like a pest. Yes, I will just have to share a few other slides about things that are happening. So, yes. Now, uh, some mm -hmm. uh, the last time we had a meeting and we were discussing on uh, how to get oral pathology promotion around the world. So first thing we thought we should have a group which can meet and discuss. So I have set up this uh, in something called Clubhouse. And I will just share that link here. So we are having our first meeting in Clubhouse tomorrow evening as per the IST time. The other times are there. I know it's an ungodly hour in parts of the world and I'm sorry for that. We'll try and see that subsequent meetings are better timed. But uh, please join up the Clubhouse. The upside with this is it's just a chat. So it's just voice. It's not as complex as having video. And also... The meeting will be recorded, so you can log in anytime and hear what was said. You can comment. And uh, it also allows interaction between people who are in the room. So if you see someone who is in the room, you can just click on their picture. You can have a conversation that is private from the room, and then you can come back. So tomorrow, we're just having a little uh, meet and greet first time to see with people uh, catch up with people from around the world and then see from there where we go next. So please do join up. And uh, another thing, of course, we also decided that we will have a group on LinkedIn. So first and foremost, it is to help everybody set up their profile, which I know many are a little lazy about it. So, so many profiles are not even active or complete, but it is the professional place. So if we want to do something professionally, this is a good place to get into. Now, this is a group I have set up, but the managers are different colleagues from around the world and uh, quite a few have agreed very kindly to be among the managers so that it's not really just supposed to be my voice it's supposed to be everybody's voice it's just a place to get together and to discuss how we can move along you know there are countries where oral pathology is not recognized at all there are countries like India where we are recognized we have a speciality that's rather quite full and thriving and in terms of numbers but we are having other problems. And then there are countries maybe like the US or England where, uh, where it is very well established. So we can all exchange ideas and see how each of us can go on to the next level of what we can do. And that is why this group is there. So please join LinkedIn and then join the group. That will be great. 
And yes, if you like today's session, there have been so many others that have been there and you can go back and check out the previous ones. This is our one playlist that is the Beyond the Borders, but there are numerous playlists that are there on YouTube. Sorry, on Facebook, we still have only a few, uh, but on YouTube, you'll find the full list. Also, if you like today's, please uh, hit like so that we know you liked it. And of course, you can follow us, you can find the details on YouTube on our page, or you can also subscribe to our newsletter. And with that, I have to say thank you to all of you. And we have reached the last session of this year. You have supported us through 2021. And I hope you will come back and join us again in the new year on the 11th of Jan. With that, I will wish you all a great, great time. And, uh, oh yes, okay. Yes, uh, this just last thing because I, it was, um, we had a little discussion on how to, the, uh, the logo for the lounge. So <laughs> there is coffee or tea and pathology. Oh. And colleagues, it should be a good mix for fruitful entertainment. Yes, so I had initially not put the microscope in there. It was getting a little difficult to add in a microscope into a coffee cup. But, well, I tried. It worked and it's there. So I hope you will come and see it. And with that, I say bye. See you all. Have fun. And let me just join. Yes.